Hi everyone, in this video we are going to cover section 5.2 titled The Definite Integral. Um, if you remember back in section 4.10, I believe it was, we were introduced to the indefinite integral and antiderivatives. Okay, so here we connect the notation of the indefinite integral, um, tweak it a little bit, and connect that to the idea of the area under a curve, and we're, we're condensing that area using that Riemann sum notation. Okay, so we begin with the definition for a definite integral, and the only difference from 4.10 is we add on this a and b here, and those that a and b represents the endpoints of our region. Okay, so our goal is still to compute the area underneath the curve by finding the by adding up the area of some rectangles. So this is you know a base times or a, excuse me a base base times a height, a base times a height, and we're adding up a bunch of areas of rectangles. But now we're connecting that with the notation that we saw previously for an indefinite integral, but these are called definite integrals. So the difference being um, now we have the bounds of our region, right? That's the new notation that we're introducing. And actually, if you stay tuned until section 5.3, that will kind of bring it full circle, connecting the antiderivative and how that relates to the area under a curve, okay? Um, and so let's look at an example, um, evaluating an integral using our definition, okay? And here we have, this is read as the integral from 0 to 2, so that's like the way you read that in your head or you read it out loud, the integral from 0 to 2 of x squared dx. And for this example, we're using the right endpoint approximation and to generate the Riemann sum. And really what we're going to do in this example is see how... Um, how inefficient this process is and why the next section will beautifully um, bring it full circle and allow us to efficiently evaluate um, antiderivative or uh, excuse me evaluate definite integrals to find areas okay so the way that we do this and you're not going to see one in the homework like this so this is more challenging than you're going to see um, but I think it's important for you to be exposed to this hopefully you're not like skipping through the video right now <laughs> um, maybe you are but that's okay. Uh, let's see. So our delta x, the, the width of each of our rectangles, has always been b minus a over n. In this case, it's 2 minus 0 over n. And we're going to leave the n there representing as many rectangles as we want within our region. Okay. Uh, the next step is going to be to find our right endpoint. And I could go through the process of where this formula comes from. If you want to look in OpenStax, um, that will show you where the, the right endpoint formula comes from. But again, you're not going to see one like this on the homework. So I'm just going to kind of give you the result. Uh, this uh, is for the right endpoint. Right end point. And this is x subscript i, so the ith endpoint is 2i over n. Okay, so the first rectangle would have an endpoint at 2 times 1 over n. The second rectangle would have an endpoint at 2 times 2 over n. The 57th rectangle would have an endpoint at 2 times 57 over n. Okay, so that's that formula. And now we're going to evaluate that endpoint, f of x is equal to, now our function is x squared, you see it up there, so it would be that 2i over n, that quantity squared, and that it gives us 4i squared over n squared. All right, so we're setting up all the pieces that we need to ultimately find our Riemann sum, set up our Riemann sum. So I think we can actually write that Riemann sum down right now. And let me see here. So we are going to say now our sum from i equals 1 up to n for n rectangles of f of x sub i times delta x. It's a sum of base times heights of rectangles is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n. The f of x sub i is this piece right there, 4 i squared over n squared, and then times delta x, 2 over n. So let's clean this up a little bit before we evaluate our sum. Um, there's a 4 times 2, which is I can pull an 8 out of the sum, 
And also, because I'm only substituting in for i, I can take this n. Ooh, I lost a squared from an earlier step. This guy should be squared. Sorry about that. I can take that n squared and that n in the denominator and factor them out of my Riemann sum. Okay, And what we're left with is the sum from i equals 1 to n of i squared. That's the only thing left inside of my Riemann sum. Okay, so that will give you, if you plug in a number for n, gosh, if you plugged in 2 for n, that would give you the sum, uh, the, the area, excuse me, not the sum, that would give you the area underneath your quadratic function using two rectangles. If you substituted in 4 for n, it would give you a more accurate area. It'd be the area under that the quadratic function using four rectangles. Okay, that's what we've set up here. Now, if you remember from the last section, awesomely, we have a formula for that. The sum from i equals 1 to n of i squared, well, that is equal to n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6, and don't forget my 8 over n to the third power. Okay, and we're going to keep going with this. So uh, this, remember, ultimately is how we are evaluating this Riemann sum, okay? And let's keep going. We're getting close to the end, I promise here. Thanks for sticking with me through this. Um, if you simplify out all of this algebra, you, you know, distribute up in the numerator and, and simplify the 8 over 6 a little bit. So, you know, this, no. If you distribute in the numerator and expand all that algebra, we can actually separate this into three separate fractions. And I'm kind of I'm skipping a little bit of the work here. Again, OpenStax will show you all of this um, in a little bit more detail. But what you end up with after you do all the algebra is 8 over 3 plus 4 over n plus 8 over 6n squared. Okay, that's what that Riemann sum simplifies to using formulas and your mad algebra skills. Okay, now to tie this all up nicely, that definite integral from, uh, from 0 to 2, 0 to 2 of x squared dx is the limit as n approaches infinity of our Riemann sum i equals 1 to n, f of x i delta x. And so if I take the limit as n approaches infinity, this term goes to 0 because the denominator gets huge, and that term approaches 0 because the denominator gets huge. So really, really long story, not that short. That is equal to 8 thirds. The area under our quadratic between 0 and 2, not the approximate area, but the exact area is equal to 8 thirds. And I know it's exact because I have drawn through skills of uh, uh, the technical skills of calculus an infinite number of rectangles by taking this limit as n approaches infinity. Right, This came from a sum of areas of rectangles. We didn't actually calculate any one individual area. We let the algebra do the work and then took the limit as you got a lot of those rectangles. And so that gives us our area under this curve of 8 thirds. But that's a pretty long, complicated process. So like I said, in the next section, we tie it together really, really nicely with a more um, standard procedure, so stay tuned for that, but we'll still go a little bit further in this section with some other techniques to get our definite integrals. Before we get to another example, um, I want to talk about the net signed area. Sometimes we have areas both above and below, or, or parts of our function that are above and below the x-axis, okay? And when we say the net signed area, um, we think of this area up here as positive because it's above the x-axis. And even though we don't really talk about area in, in technical terms as being negative, when that area is below the x-axis, when we compute the net signed area, we subtract it, okay? So we, sub we subtract the area of those three rectangles from the area of the four above. So if I were to like label this as a sub one, 
and label that down there as A sub 2. Then the net signed area of that region, the net signed area would be A1 minus A2. You let the stuff below the x-axis cancel out the stuff above the x-axis. And we'll do an example where we find the net signed area. All right, and our function is f of x equals 2x. We should be able to draw that with reasonable accuracy. And our interval is from negative 3 to positive 3. So I am going to sketch this out. 3, 4, 5, there we go. Um, so let's see, our y-intercept is 0, and our slope is up to... <clears throat> excuse me, up to over 1. Up to over 1. And I didn't do enough tick marks there. That's 6. And I need one more down there. So I'm going to go down to back 1, down to back 1, down to back 1, like that. And there's my line, my function f of x equals 2x. And what you can see is if we're looking over our bounds from negative 3 up to positive 3. Okay, if I could draw this with any accuracy, let's see, like that, and kind of like that, there we go. Then we have these two triangular regions um, that we're trying to find the area of. And hey, I knew how to find area of a triangle way before I ever took calculus. So for this one, um, I'm going to set it up using the fancy notation. We are evaluating the definite integral from negative 3 to positive 3 of 2x dx. And that is given by the area of that triangle, 1 half, the base is 3, because I can see 3 here, and the height is 6 minus the area of the other triangle, the one below the x-axis, 1 half times the base of that triangle is 3. The height of that triangle is also 6. So when we uh, multiply all this out, 9 minus 9, the net signed area is 0. That triangle and that triangle have a net area of 0. So now we'll contrast that idea of net area with something called total area. And it's important when you get to the homework, or are you looking for the net or are you looking for the total? If we're looking for the total area, then that is given by the integral from A to B of the absolute value of f of x dx, right? We want the absolute value of our function. So if we have, you know, two regions, one above and one below the x-axis, we actually add their areas together. As instead of letting the, the region below cancel out the region above, we want to know what their total, what they add together to give us. All right. So in this example, we'll do that. We'll find the total area. All right. And our function is f of x is equal to x minus 2. And our interval is from 0 to 6. So I'm going to sketch this region out. Here's my x-axis, my y-axis. 3, 4, 5, 6, and let's see, it has a y-intercept of negative 2 and a slope of up 1 over 1. Up 1 over 1, 2, 3, 4, there we go. And then this is 1, 2, 3, 4 for that last point. All right, so what we can see, and let me draw my line. There it is. So now we're talking between the function and the x-axis. What is my region? Well, here I see I've got a triangle. And then down there, I can see I have another little tiny triangle. So for this problem, the, uh, the total area is given by the integral from 0 to 6 of the absolute value of our function x minus 2 dx and we're adding the area of those two triangles together. Um, if you were actually to graph the absolute value function, it would look really, really similar, except that green line that goes below would actually V up and come up here. Okay, that's what it would look like if you were to graph the absolute value function. Um, but we have just the regular function, and we're finding the total area.
but I can get the area of these two triangles. I just need to know one half. The base of this triangle is two, and the height of that triangle also two, plus one half the base of this triangle is one, two, three, four. The height of that triangle is also four. All right, half of two times two, that's gonna be just two. Half of four times four is eight. Two plus eight is 10. So the area between that function and the x-axis over the given interval is 10 square units. And we don't typically write the units with these problems unless it were like a word problem or something. So you can see through these two examples that we've done, um, they're much more direct than the first one. Uh, again, that first example was challenging. I hope you were just trying to soak in some of that information, let it you know glaze over you a little bit, that's okay. Uh, these are more procedurally what you'll be doing in this section. And like I said, in, in 5.3, we'll have the, the standard process introduced connecting antiderivatives with area, all right? Now, moving on to this last part of the section deals with just properties. Um, there's a lot of them on here. I'm really just going to mention um, two of them specifically. Uh, if I have the integral from a to a of f of x dx, remember, that's the area, and my two endpoints are the same. So that's the area underneath a single point on my function. And hopefully it makes sense why that's zero, right? There's no, there's no horizontal distance. I'm just looking between A and A. So that would be like a one-dimensional uh, area, which it's it's zero. And then the number two there, the integral from, notice here the, the order changes, B to A, A to B. Well, those differ by a negative sign. So you can actually switch the bounds of your integral. You can flip them um, and factor out a negative sign. And that's sometimes necessary and helpful um, in, in, in evaluating things. Uh, and the rest are pretty standard properties. You can break up a sum. You can break up a difference and look at each one individually. You can factor a constant out of your integral. And then number six, uh, the integral from A to B is equal to the integral from A to C plus the integral from C to B. That is saying you can separate your region up into two separate, uh, up into two different regions for your integral. All right, that is it for the properties. Um, you're going to use some of those properties with a couple of homework problems. If you have any questions as you go through the homework, please send me an email. Let me know what you're struggling with. Um, as always, thank you very much for listening and have a wonderful day.